Good morning, everyone. Um, as Mark said, my name is Ian Linden. I'm technical manager for pensions at James Hay. Um, some of you I've met in the past. Some of you were here six months ago. Um, but just for those that don't really know what we do in technical support is that we provide generic opinion and guidance on pension tax legislation as well as tax and trusts. Um, and uh, basically what we do is give you an opinion based on that legislation rather than how James Hay as a company operate. So we don't really know the products particularly well. If you've got questions about the products, then that's the business development managers um, you would need to speak to. Um, what we do, um, we have the website, um, which has got a technical hub. Um, if you're looking for any technical input and um, just some background before you maybe even pose the question to us, then we will write technical papers based on current legislation, changes in the legislation and so on. And in fact, what we're going to talk about today, um, my colleague John Dunn has done two or three um, tech talks on it. So if you're not quite following the gibberish that I'm going to talk about shortly, um, that's the place to go. Um, as Mark said, um, this is the second time we've set up the symposium. Um, in each instance, um, when they were first mooted, I was asked to do the technical session, um, whereas my colleague Neil um, is going to choose a slightly, a, sorry, slightly more light-hearted um, topic to cover. Um, and given that I'm going to cover off the proposals contained in the summer budget around pension input periods um, and the tapered annual allowance, while Neil indulges you with a bit of banter this afternoon, um, it made me sort of think that this is very much like some comedy double act that we're doing. Um, however, unlike the traditional Laurel and Hardy, Mocum and Wise, or Cannon and Ball, although I think the latter is questionable whether that was comedy, um, it struck me more that um, this was a sort of Oh, not getting, hold on. The double act that we're talking about. So if some of you aren't familiar with these images, um, these are from Despicable Me. Um, Neil being grew there, and me being one of his minions. Um, and again, if you're not familiar with it, then the minions basically speak gibberish. They just talk rubbish. <laughs> Nobody understands them. Um, hopefully that's not going to happen today, but a combination of the terminology I'm going to use, plus the Scottish accent, might confuse some of you. Okay. And on that subject of terminology, let's just look at some of the things that we're going to throw at you today. Um, some of these you will be familiar with, some of them you won't. Certainly the top lot um, you should be familiar with, but the ones towards the bottom are the terms that have been introduced as a result of the summer budget. Um, sorry, give me a second. <coughs> um, what we're going to do today is pick up on some of these so that we ground this session um, and you firmly understand where we're going with it because as with all things in pension legislation, it's never as simple as it first appears. Um, and so to begin with, what I want to do is look at the annual allowance and the mechanics of how you measure um, pension savings against the annual allowance. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, then move on to um, the proposals contained within the summer budget. Okay. Um, so just looking at the annual allowance to begin with, um, it's just a mechanism to control the tax advantages of pension, just like the lifetime allowance is as well. Um, and the thing about the annual allowance is someone can exceed their annual allowance, and when they do that, then they become liable to the annual allowance charge. And the mechanism that is used to pay that charge is that when the individual exceeds their annual allowance, they put into their tax return that they have an annual allowance charge to pay. And then HMRC add that to their income for the year and calculate the tax charge at their marginal rate. Now, the thing you might not have clicked up there was it's the responsibility of the individual to put in their tax return that they have an annual allowance charge to pay. How members of the public are supposed to know that? And given the complexity that they keep adding to it with respect to pension legislation is way beyond me. But again, if the individual doesn't do that, then they suffer penalties for not notifying HMRC that they've got additional tax to pay. So that's where you guys have to sort of step in and say, this is what you need to be aware of. Okay. And then just to sort of um, get you reminiscing about the good old days of Morecambe and Wise, um, might be surprised of how good it was or how bad it was. If you've ever sort of seen one of the reruns of some of their shows, and you think, I thought that was funny at the time. I'm not so sure now. Um, but anyway, what we're looking at here is the history of um, the annual allowance. Um, and it's, you know, the halcyon days of 255,000 of an annual allowance. That was only four tax years ago. We're now in a situation where a significant proportion of your clients 
might be caught by the money purchase annual allowance, which is £10,000, or for the high earning individuals from next April, the tapered annual allowance of £10,000 as well. So we've gone in four short years from an annual allowance of 255000 to an annual allowance now of potentially £10,000. Okay. And the point I want to make about this slide is the very last bullet point. As a result of the tapering of the annual allowance introduced from next April, your clients potentially could have one of 30,000 annual allowances. And then the following year, because of bonus, pay rises, etc., etc., they could have a different annual allowance to work with. So, as I said earlier, more complexity when all we really want is simplicity. Okay. So, um, if we know what that's about, how do you actually measure someone's pension savings against the annual allowance? Well, the first thing to think about, um, if that is turned up, yeah, is the pension <coughs> input period. Um, and just looking at the mechanics of how this is done, um, the pension input period is the period over which um, an individual's pension savings are measured. Okay? Um, and in the past, um, PITs didn't necessarily have to be aligned with a tax year. So in other words, if someone had a pension input period that ran from the 1st of May to the 30th of April, and they paid a contribution on the 14th of March 2014, then for tax relief purposes, that was assessed against their income in that tax year, the 13-14 tax year. However, the next pension input period end date was the 30th of April the following year, and therefore annual allowance purposes, that contribution was assessed against the annual allowance in that following tax year. The changes that are proposed in the budget are to align uh, pension input periods with the tax year going forward. Okay? And we'll pick up a little bit about that um, shortly. Um, so it was possible um, for people to have any number of pips ending in different tax years and at different times in the year, which confused the hell out of everybody. Certainly encouraged advisors like yourself to phone up the technical support unit with the basic question of, can you help me? I'm struggling with this. And particularly where you were looking at the tax relief element and the annual allowance element. And if you looked at them at the same time, it became very confusing very, very quickly. So we always advocated that you look at the tax relief side of it first and then look at the annual allowance side of it separately. And that was the way to get your head around it. And I, I'm not being derogatory about that. That's the way I do it as well. Okay. So um, having looked at that, um, then what is it you're actually measuring against the PIP? And that's what's called the pension input amount. All right. So the pointy-headed people at the Treasury come up with this fantastic term pension input amount. So what is the pension input amount? Well, it's basically the increase in an individual's pension savings over that tax year, okay, or that PIP. Um, and an individual might have a number of pension input amounts for different pension arrangements they have in place, okay? And therefore, what you're measuring is that total amount in pension savings into their pension arrangements over that pension input period, and then when that pension input period ends within the tax year, that's what you measure against the annual allowance for that tax year. Okay. Excuse me a second. <coughs> um, so the thing to bear in mind here is that even if someone pays more than they're entitled to for tax relief purposes, so by way of an example, let's say an individual takes a sabbatical from work, um, they continue to pay in their contributions as they were previously. So let's say they're saying they're paying £10,000 a year into their pension. They notify the um, <coughs> provider that they're going to continue to pay those contributions. Then because they've got no relevant earnings, they're not entitled to any tax relief other than what's called the basic amount, which is that 3600 gross or 28 net. Um, but the excess that they're not entitled to tax relief still counts towards their pension input amount for that tax year and therefore it's measured against the annual allowance. So someone, if they were doing that and subject to the provider allowing them to do it, they would basically be losing the right to fund pensions once they return to work and make use of that unused annual allowance that they've used up because of the continuing to fund the contribution at £10,000. Now you might think that no, that doesn't happen, but I can assure you it does. We've got calls from people who have um, stopped work for a few years, the advisors coming along and ask, 
why are you paying £15,000 into your pension? Oh, well, that was what I was paying before, so I've just let it run on. Um, that individual wasn't entitled to the tax relief, so they have to try and unwind the contributions um, for tax relief purposes. If the provider won't refund the contribution, then it has to be treated as a gross contribution, and the tax relief has to go back to HMRC. So it's not as uncommon as maybe you think it might be. Okay. Now, um, the situation is that um, when you look at money purchase arrangements, okay, so SIPs, etc., it's relatively straightforward. All you do is total up all the gross contributions made in that year in question, and that is then measured against the pension input <coughs> amount. Okay? But the thing is, if you'd read one of the points before, I mentioned the term pension savings, and the reason for that is because in a final salary scheme, it is not the money that the individual is paying into the pension scheme or that the employer is paying in, it's a notional contribution. Um, and this is where it gets a little bit complicated, all right? Um, so let's just assume that this individual um, has pensions at the beginning of the tax year equivalent to just shy of uh, 30, uh, sorry, 40,000. And then at the end of the tax year, um, because of pay rises, another year in service, their pension rights have accrued to 42,000. <coughs> so how do you determine the pension input amount for that individual? Well, um, I'm sure you probably can't read that. I do apologise, but um, there will be copies of the slides um, for you later. Um, but effectively what you do is you look at what's called the opening balance, which is that 39360. You multiply it by a factor of 16, which is a factor that is within the legislation. So the 16 uh, factor isn't plucked out there by myself. That's what you multiply it by. And then you uprate it by CPI for the previous um, September, and that gives you your opening balance. Then you do a similar calculation at the end of the tax year, so 16 times the 42,000. Take one from the other, and that gives you your uh, pension input amount uh, for that individual that you then measure against the annual earnings. All right? Now, just a word of advice here and a word of caution. Um, that gives you a ballpark figure. If you're advising clients on funding a money purchase arrangement concurrently with their final salary scheme, I would go to the pension administrator or the manager of the pension scheme to verify the numbers of what the pension input amount is before you do any planning. Because each scheme, or not each scheme as well, but a lot of schemes have got their own little idiosyncrasies. And if you're not aware of that, that number that you think is fairly accurate could be way, way wide of the mark. Okay, we had an example a couple of years ago where an individual, an advisor, reckoned that um, someone could put in about 40,000 into their pension, um, into their SIP. Um, they went to the uh, pension manager and the figure that came back was that basically they had no unused annual allowance to work with. So if the advisor had gone ahead and put the 40k into the pension, all that would have happened is that individual would have an annual allowance charged to pay on that £40,000 because he had no unused annual allowance to work with. Okay? Um, I don't envy you in trying to advise clients on that and certainly as a result of the changes in the legislation proposed within the and the finance bill at the moment, it gets even more complicated. Okay. So are we all with me so far? Because we're now getting a wee bit more <laughs> technical. Um, the, uh, the stick, right, okay. So um, before we sort of delve into the, uh, the changes announced in the budget, um, you know, I'm sure you're glad to know that there's a, a coffee break coming after this. Um, and that you know, if the caffeine has been coursing through your body so far has run out, then we've got maybe 10 minutes or so or 20 minutes before you can replenish that. Um, because as I said, we're now getting into this sort of the nitty gritty of what has been proposed. All right. So um, what have we got? Well, basically, the Chancellor stood up on the um, 8th of July uh, and announced that as of today, any pension input period that was open today closes today. So that includes all money purchase arrangements, all final salary schemes, the PIP ended on that day. Um, and that's what's called the pre-alignment tax year. So the pre-alignment tax year is from the 5th of April 2015 to the 8th of July 2015. And then we have a post-alignment tax year, which is that because the PIP ended on the 8th of July, a new PIP starts on the 9th of July 2015 and will run to the 5th of April 2016. Okay. Now, if you think about what I was talking about earlier with pension input periods, straddling tax year ends and so on, there could have been individuals 
in May, for instance, and if we took that example of someone with a PIP ending on the 30th of April, they could have, because of fears of the loss of higher rate relief um, before the budget, have made a contribution on, say, the 2nd of May, making full use of their annual allowance of 40k, but that PIP would have ended on the 30th of April 2016. So they were a year ahead of themselves for annual allowance purposes. So to avoid that individual or those individuals having an annual allowance charge to pay, what they did was they said that in the pre-alignment tax year, the annual allowance will be £80,000. And in the post-alignment tax year, i.e. the 9th of July to the 5th of April 2016, the annual allowance will be zero. However, you can carry up to 40,000 from the pre-alignment tax year into the post-alignment tax year. And that was obviously done because there would have been people, a lot of people, who would have not paid any contributions into the pension arrangement in the period the 5th of April to the 8th of July. People who have their own business who would wait towards the end of the year to see what profitability was like before making the contributions. Okay. So you can carry forward from the pre-alignment tax year into the post-alignment tax year up to £40,000. And the normal carry forward rules also apply. So any previous unused annual allowance um, from the three years prior to the current tax year <coughs> can still be used. So to try and explain that a little bit better or more, um, let's look at a couple of examples. Now, this is the old regime, um, assuming that the PIP ran from the 6th of April to the 5th of April. This individual um, had no carry forward from the 12-13 tax year. They had 20,000 from the year after that, and then 14-15 tax year, they had 30,000. So under the old um, rules, the individual pays 30,000 pounds into their pension this tax year. Okay. Annual allowance is 40, so they carry forward 10 into the 15-16 tax year. So they would have 40,000 in the 16-17 tax year, sorry. <laughs> Another 10 from the 15, 16, 20, sorry, can't read that there, 30 from uh, the year before that, and then the year before that, another um, 20. Okay, we all right with that so far? So, what did the Chancellor do? Well, what he did was this. He ended all the pips on the 9th of July, the 8th of July, new pips starting then. Individuals still paying 30,000 in, in that period. Annual allowance is 80 in that pre alignment period. And in the post alignment period, he carries forward, or she carries forward, £40,000. Right. They stuck another £30,000 in there when this is the situation. Okay. So in other words, what they've got is you can almost ignore the contribution that was paid in that pre-alignment tax year for carry-forward purposes. Okay. Tax relief purposes obviously still has a bearing because the individual would have to have relevant UK earnings at least equal to the 60,000 because that's what they've paid in the tax year. But for annual allowance purposes, they've still got 10,000 to carry forward because they're taking that 10,000 from the post alignment period. And then they've got the other unused annual allowance from the previous two years to work with as well. Okay. What if someone had thought again, on the idea that if we're going to lose high rate relief, I'll mop up my full unused annual allowance in that pre-alignment period. <coughs> okay, so this individual puts in 90,000 post-alignment tax year. Because they've paid more than the 80,000, there is no carry forward to work with in the post-alignment year, but they still have the carry forward from the previous couple of years. Okay. So what they could do is still put in £30,000 there. All right. So the way the numbers stack up in terms of carry forward, the 90000 exceeds the 80000 annual allowance in the pre-alignment period. So 10000 over. The 10000 then comes from the 13-14 tax year because you go back to the furthest back year where there's unused annual allowance. That leaves them with 10 in the 13-14 tax year plus 30 in the 14-15. All right. He then paid a further 30,000 in the post-alignment period, meaning he strips out <coughs> everything from the previous years other than the 14-15 year because he's still got 10 left from that. All right. Pension simplicity. <laughs> All right. So um, that's really how it works with respect to uh, money purchase arrangements. 
I want to now very, very quickly look at defined benefits. Now, GMC obviously don't get involved in defined benefits. Um, we don't get an awful lot of questions in the TSU about it. Um, but I think it's important from your perspective to sort of have some understanding of how this is going to work. Um, and, and basically, the first thing to think about is this period called com the combined period. And what that does is it's looking at all the pips that end in the pre and post alignment tax years. So you could have a, um, a final salary scheme, for instance, like the NHS, where the PIP ends on, I think it's the 30th of March. So that pension arrangement ended on the 30th of March. A new one started on the 30th, 1st of March. And then instead of running to the 30th of March 2016, get my tax years right here, it ended again on the 8th of July this year. And then the next one runs from the 9th of July to the 5th of April because we're looking at the alignment of pips with the tax year ends. Okay? So what you have to look at is the number of days in that combined period. And there's a couple of examples here. I'm not going to label them. But if we just look at the first one, um, which is a sort of similar to what I was saying there, PIP starts on the 1st of April. Then there's 371 days in that pension input period for this pre- and post-alignment period. And then what you need to do is you need to apportion it across the two periods. All right. So the numerator is always 272 days because that's the number of days from the 9th of July to the 5th of April. But then the denominator, which is what you divide it by, will vary depending on the pension scheme that you're looking at and what the PIP end dates are. But you can, in theory, <coughs> depending on when PIPs end, get up to a denominator of over 700 days. All right. And then what you need to do, if you can cast your mind back to that notional contribution that is made in a final salary scheme, i.e. not the money that the individual has paid into their pension or the employer, but this notional contribution, you then need to do that. Okay? Um, basically, what you do is you take their salary or their pen, right? You then multiply that by their service, and then you take that 1.025. This is sl done slightly differently, actually, I've just realised. Um, and then you look at the closing balance, you take the one from the other, and that gives you a pension input amount of 60,000 in this instance. All right. And then you apportion it. The pre-alignment period um, gives you um, 16,000. But in this example, the post-alignment gives you 44. Now, if that individual had no unused annual allowance to work with, they could have had an annual allowance charge. But would they have had an annual allowance charge to pay? Sorry? They would have had carry forward from the pre alignment period to work with. So even though they had exhausted their pension um, contributions in the previous three years, so had no unused annual allowance to carry from the previous years, because the pension input amount in the pre alignment period is only 14,000 or, or whatever it was. 16,000, sorry, they've actually not used up that full 80k in that year. All right. All following this? Sorry, but he's not, I'm sorry, he's not carrying anything. He's not used up. In the pre alignment period, he's only used 16,000. Out of the 80. So he's carrying 40. Sorry, you're right. Apologies, <laughs> just realised it's 44. You're right, sorry. He's got no, he has, does have an annual lunch charge to pay of £4,000. Sorry, I'm, I've got so many examples of these in my head at the moment. Um, so, yes, apologies, he does have £4,000 of an annual lunch charge to pay. That's right, apologies there. Um, I'm thinking about some, another example I've done with someone. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, um, sorry, I should have maybe picked that up. Unlike see, when you're doing it under the old regime and going forward in a normal year, this is an exceptional year because we've got this change in the pension input period to align it with the tax year. So the, um, rather than CPI, we're using a flat rate for that period. So you're not looking at the CPI figure for September of last year. You're using that standard at 2.5. Yeah. Okay. It's just, this complexity just applies to this tax year, okay? All right. Okay, so far? And this is still Tell the 
Uh, yep. Um, and the thing to bear in mind about this is um, people won't know about this from their um, pension provider, their final salary scheme until prob probably October next year. Because um, with respect to annual allowance issues, um, the legislation states that if someone pays more than the pension input amount of 40,000, i.e. above the annual allowance, whether that's in a money purchase arrangement or in a final salary scheme, the provider of the scheme has to notify the individual by the October following that tax year that they've paid in more than that. Okay. May I ask one question? There are some circumstances where you get a company that finishes a final salary then continues on a money purchase. So you have two schemes, one maybe over a period of two or three years. Uh -huh. How the hell do you work out carry forward then? That's for you to do and <laughs> advise your clients. <laughs> Well, no, this is, this is just an exceptional year because of this ending of the PIP on the 8th of July, all right? So it, this really only applies in respect of alignment, etc., to this, um, uh, sorry, a, apportionment to this year, okay? Well, okay, we're just about to cover that, all right. So we've looked at the complexity there. I don't actually want to labour DB schemes <laughs> because it's not part of our sort of area, but there we go. Um, so what they've also proposed in the, uh, the budget is this introduction of um, the tapered annual allowance. Um, now, quite interesting that um, when, uh, was it Gordon Brown or Alistair Darling, can never quite remember, introduced special annual allowance. Um, basically, George Osborne said, this is ridiculous. Why are you limiting people to tax relief like this through their pension? This is incredibly complicated. And then all he's done is come out with his own version of that complexity. Okay. Um, so what we've got is we've got this introduction of the tapered annual allowance um, from next April. Now, bear in mind, um, this is still um, part of the finance bill, so it's not yet legislation. It could change. Um, but um, it's unlikely to change significantly because some people are already making use of some of these opportunities that we've spoken about today. Um, but um, <coughs> what we've got is we've got two new terms introduced, this thing called the adjusted income. If an individual has um, adjusted income above 150,000, then for each two pound over that 150,000, they will lose a pound in their annual allowance to the point that when they get to 210,000 pounds, they will have zero of the adjustment and be left with 10,000 of annual allowance, okay? So everyone above 210,000 pounds will have maxed out on the loss of their 40K and be left with just 10,000 to work with going forward, okay? But you can still use carry forward of tapered annual allowance to work with, okay? But as I said earlier, someone in a occupation or job where they've got variable bonuses, one year they could have 25,000 annual allowance, the following year they could be down to 10, then you need to look at what they've paid in in the period, what they've got to carry forward and so on and so forth. So it just becomes <laughs> incredibly complex very, very quickly um, and again I don't envy you guys to try and keep track of that. Does that apply to the employer yeah, you know, uh, what makes up the pension input amount is all contributions, so that is whether they're personal, employer, or even third party, okay? So a grandparent funding money into, say, a, an adult grandchild's pension who's also funding their own pension, then the grandparent's contribution counts towards the pension input amount as well, okay? Uh, and, and then when you look at the, the, the what is um, this adjusted income, the definition of it, um, well, what it does is it references the Income Tax Act 2007, Section 23. And, and if you look at that, what it says is that um, for the purposes of this um, section, um, the income is, or the, the income an individual has is um, the amount of income in which the taxpayer is charged to income tax. So that includes their earned income, interest from the banks and building society, rental income from um, property that they're letting out, dividends, so again, in um, small companies where the director has taken a relatively small salary and then the rest is dividends, that will be part of their adjusted income. Okay. 
Um, and then what it goes on to say is in step two of that section, um, less any allowances, and I think it's <coughs> section five, and then it lists a whole number of um, allowances that someone can offset against that income, or that definition of income. And interestingly enough, that includes pensions. So it tells you to take that adjusted, what is effectively adjusted income, take the pension and uh, contributions off it. Uh, and then in step two of the definition of adjusted income, it says add back in those pension contributions. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> again, <laughs> incredibly complex area, not where I specialise in income tax, and really the only person that can give you any indication of what your client's adjusted income is, is his accountant. Um, uh, I hope there are no accountants in the room, um, because we often get the question, um, um, I'm wanting, the client wants to pay an employer contribution, and how much can they pay in and get corporation tax relief? Uh, that's a question the, your accountant has to answer for you. Well, interestingly enough, the accountant said to the client, speak to your advisor. He can give you an opinion on it. So similarly, I think what you're going to find is when you talk to clients about their adjusted income um, and you reference the go to speak to your accountant, the accountant will probably bounce it back to you. All right. But that's the critical thing is this adjusted income because anything above the 150, you're losing a pound in annual allowance for every two pound over that. The other um, term that we have to look at is this thing called threshold income which um, if the individual has threshold income below 110,000, then it's unlikely that they will be caught by the reduction in their annual allowance. Okay. All right. Now, no, I'm trying to avoid them, actually, after the, the mistake I made earlier. Um, no, uh, but it, the same principle applies. If you're looking at... Um, someone with income around that 150,000, then what you need to do is what we've showed earlier. You need to look at the pension input amount for the DB scheme. And it's not necessarily the contributions, okay? But you need to look at that as well. Now, uh, at the end of the day, uh, 40 minutes here, up here, twittering away is a long time, but there's no way we can actually cover all the complexity in this. Um, so. If you want to sort of know how it works with respect to a DB scheme, there is a tech talk on the website done by my colleague John that looks at what is, what is it you're adding back in in the case of a DB scheme. All right, but I just really don't have the time to do that. Um, so just moving on very quickly, um, 10,000 annual allowance. I accept that the sort of people that are caught by this are your clients or your prospective clients, but from the perspective of the Treasury, this is low-hanging fruit because okay, it's only a small number of people that are caught by this adjusted income over 150,000. Um, we've had lots in the press and various other places about the fact that there's a huge amount of tax relief given to higher rate taxpayers and um, ad additional rate taxpayers. This is an easy pick for the Treasury to get back some of that money that they think they're losing. Okay? And I believe it's the first step in the process to limit to actually what we'll ultimately end up with, whether it's a flat rate or whatever, I don't know. Um, but it's the, obviously, in my opinion, just the first step in that process. So, and just by way of sort of looking at the fact that it is relatively low hanging fruit, um, this is from the Office of National Statistics. All it does is it looks at the median total contributions um, paid into pensions um, for people in the 50 plus age range, okay? Um, and just for you people, um, I've always got to think about what is the median, the mode, and the mean. Um, so the median is the one in the middle, okay? Not the average. So they line up all the percentage of pension contributions, and the one in the middle is the median, okay? So of 101, it's the 51st one, all right? The one in the middle, okay? Um, but what it shows is, not surprisingly, in the um, public sector, there's far greater contributions going in. Now remember, that's contributions, it's not pension input amount, okay? Because potentially, someone paying contributions of 20 or 30,000 or something like that could actually have a pension input amount of 40 or 50,000 pounds, you know? So when you speak to your clients that are particularly in uh, public sector schemes about, you know, the, the right, their pension benefits and how good they are, there is no way that they're actually paying in enough to buy the benefits that they're receiving, okay? So despite what they say about how tough it is in the public sector, you know, it's a personal bugbear of mine. I've got 
my brother and his wife that work in the public sector, and I'm fed up listening to them yap on <laughs> about their pension and their salary and everything else. Anyway, and then another one. Um, here we go. So I always talk about it because it just annoys me. Um, and then this is just looking at the same level of data, but for contributions made for people with 40,000 plus. All right. So again, and I think you'll see um, percentages there. So um, basically, in the case of public sector, 25% is going into their pension. Okay, in the last sort of year that was referenced here, whereas in the case of um, the private sector, it's significantly less than that. Okay, and then so you know we're in a situation where we're talking now about a lifetime allowance of a million pounds, and potentially a lot of people caught by ten thousand. Why would people want to do pensions? Well, one interesting thing perhaps to say is then looking back to two thousand and nine, when George Osborne was Shadow Chancellor, he said on a number of occasions that basically fifty thousand pounds per annum as a pension was actually more than adequate for people. And lo and behold, in the public sector, if you take a lifetime allowance of a million pounds, the factor you use to determine how much of the lifetime allowance used up for the DB scheme is to multiply their pension by 20. So someone on a 50,000 pension multiplied by 20 gives you a million pounds. Okay? And then 10,000 pounds of an annual allowance? Well, this is just something I did. Um, basically looking at someone in their early 30s, funding their pension for 35 years, paying £10,000 a year, 5% return, um, and basically they get to just sort of about 900000 as a fund size. Okay? And what it doesn't include is that if they, you work the last year of growth of 5% before they pay the 36 contribution of £10,000, it's about 948000 so just shy of the million pounds. So it probably doesn't come as any surprise that we are now talking about annual allowances of £10,000 and lifetime allowance. Can I ask you why is there a lifetime allowance if they, if they have a <coughs> annual allowance? Do you want my honest opinion or do you want... <laughs> um, I, this, again, this is purely personal. I think where you're talking money purchase, you're taking all the risks. So I think for money purchase arrangements, there should be no lifetime allowance. This is a personal view. In no way reflects James Hayes' view or what Alistair's going to put in his responses to um, the Treasury, etc. But I don't think there should be any lifetime allowance associated with um, money purchase arrangements because you're carrying all the risk personally, um, even with the evening out of market returns, etc. Okay? But I think with respect to final salary schemes, then there should be because they're carrying no risk. We as taxpayers are carrying the risk. Lower. Pardon? Lower. Well, I think if you're going to do something, you leave it. But I mean, there's, again, there's a million pounds. Is, you know, you're talking 40 years service, 100,000. There's not that many people, in, um, certainly in local government, for instance, that are on 100,000 relative to the proportion of the, the employed populace. But, um, you know, certainly senior level, a million pounds gives you 50K a pension. Okay, um, so very quickly, um, I know I'm way over my time, um, really what we wanted was simplicity, all we've got is more complexity, um, carry forward is not a case of just taking what the annual allowance is, less what the person paid in the tax year in question, what you've got to do is determine their adjusted income, look at what the then annual allowance is from that, the tapered annual allowance, take off what they paid in that year and remember that because next year it's probably going to be very different. Um, and just be aware that where people are using employer contributions to mop up unused annual allowance, then that employer contribution is added on, money purchase anyway, is added on to their income to determine their adjusted income. So in other words, if someone had adjusted income that was below the threshold, so it took them down to say 120,000, and the company had a good tax year, and they said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to pay the 40,000 in for this year, using up your annual allowance, and the 20,000 that we haven't used previously, that takes the individual up to 200,000. Right? So the 50,000 above the adjusted income level, so they lose 25,000 pounds in the annual allowance. So they didn't have 40 in that tax year, they only had 25. And if the company did that at the beginning of the year, it's only at the end of the year does a person know what their income is from the business. Okay. So um, I don't really envy you guys out there trying to explain to clients how that's going to work. All right. I'll be listening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Lovely.